We now come to the questions to the Prime Minister, but before. But what I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We now start with questions, Prime Minister Rachel Muskell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Number one, please. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Rachel Buskell. David Amos and James Brokenshire were both tragically taken from us. Both served this place with integrity and served their constituents well. And as we offer our heartfelt love and prayers to their families, their families have offered us a new path to a new politics built on kindness and love. Mr Speaker, Sarah Everard and Claudia Lawrence were both from York. And right now, women are feeling unsafe. Many women are unsafe. And the very people that should be protecting us are telling us to engage with potential perpetrators to identify them, to flag down a bus, or to know the laws of arrest better. Confidence in the police has taken its toll. But as women, we are confident and determined to change this. So every girl and every woman can live at home without fear, can go to school or work without harassment, can go online without objectification, and can walk our streets safely again. What steps will the Prime Minister take to ensure women with lived experience can lead on this work, and by when? Prime Minister. I I thank her very much for her question, and she raises a most important issue, Mr Speaker, one of the most important that this country faces. And I want all people in this country, particularly women, uh, to feel confident in our police force, and I believe that they can and uh, that they should. And what we're doing now to make sure that women in particular feel safe at night is we're investing in uh, safer streets, in better street lighting, in more CCTV. But what we also have to do, Mr Speaker, as I think the whole House understands, is ensure we deal with the systemic problems in the criminal justice system uh, to ensure that that men, and I'm afraid it is almost always men, get prosecuted for rape and for crimes of serious sexual and domestic violence uh, in the way that they should, and that we secure the convictions that we should, Mr Speaker, and that when we secure those convictions, those individuals get the tough sentencing that they deserve, Mr Speaker, and that's what this side of the House (coughs) believes in. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Having a prematurely born child in neonatal intensive care means that for families, every day can be a struggle, practically, financially and emotionally. Trying to continue with life as normal whilst racked with worry and a guilt that simply never leaves you is just not possible. That's why the Prime Minister's commitment to deliver neonatal even pay for parents in this situation is so important. So will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss how quickly we can put this through Parliament so parents are getting this support as quickly as possible? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I will make sure that my right honourable friend, my honourable friend has uh, the relevant meeting as fast as we can, uh, we can organise it. And I know that many parents, uh, particularly those who have premature and sick babies, feel that the current system isn't working well for them. And that's why I can uh, tell my honourable friend we will legislate to allow parents of children in neonatal care to take extended leave. Details of this policy were published last year, and we will bring forward the legislation as soon as possible. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I pay tribute to Ernie Ross, a formidable campaigner who served this place and his constituents with great distinction for three decades? Uh, Mr Speaker, I will pay my respects and tribute to James Brokenshire immediately after this Prime Minister's questions. Can I thank the whole House for the way the tributes to Sir David were handled on Monday? We saw the best of this House, and I want to see if we can use that collaborative spirit to make progress on one of the issues that was raised on Monday, tackling violent extremism. It's three years since the Government promised an online safety bill, but it's not yet before the House. Meanwhile, the damage caused by harmful content online is worse than ever. Dangerous algorithms on Facebook and Instagram and Hope Not Hate have shown me an example of violent Islamism and far-right propaganda on TikTok. What I was shown has been reported to the moderators, but it stayed online because apparently 
it didn't contravene the guidelines. I have to say, I find that hard to believe. So will the Prime Minister build on the desire shown by this House on Monday to get things done and commit to bring forward the second reading of the online safety bill by the end of this calendar year? If he does, we'll support it. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for the spirit in which he has approached this issue, and I echo what he says about the need for cooperation across the House, because the safety of, of MPs, indeed of all uh, public servants, everybody who engages uh, with the public is of vital importance, and uh, the online safety bill is of, of huge importance to uh, it's one of the most important tools in our armoury. And what we're doing is ensuring that we crack down on uh, companies that promote illegal and, uh, and dangerous content, and we'll be uh, toughening up uh, those provisions. But, Mr Speaker, what we are also going to do is ensure that uh, the online safety bill does complete uh, its, uh, its stages uh, before this House, uh, before, uh, before Christmas. And I'm delighted, uh, or rather, that we do bring, forward, uh, the, uh, bring it forward before Christmas in the way, that he, uh, the way that he suggests. And I'm delighted, Mr Speaker, that he is uh, offering his support. And, uh, and we, we look forward to that. Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister. I, I think from that, um, and this isn't a challenge, it's to clarify that the pre-legislative scrutiny will be finished um, before, in early December, uh, uh, and that the second reading could, uh, I think, be before uh, the end of this calendar year. Um, but we do need to get on with this. Telegram has been described as the app of choice for extremists. Uh, uh, and, Mr Speaker, if you can believe it, if the House can believe it, as we were paying tribute to Sir David on Monday, Telegram users could access videos of murders and violent threats against politicians, the LGBT community, women and Jews, as we were paying our respects. Some of these posts are illegal. All of them are harmful. And Hope Not Hate and the Board of Deputies have said that Telegram has, in their words, facilitated and nurtured a subculture that cheerleads for terrorists. Tough sanctions are clearly needed. Yet, under the government's current proposals, directors of platforms failing to crack down on extremism would still not face criminal sanctions. Why is that? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the, this, this, it is this government that brought forward an online uh, harms bill. Mr Speaker, and he's heard, uh, it's, he's heard what I've said. He's heard what I've said about, uh, about the second reading before Christmas. And you know, in the, in the collegiate spirit in which uh, he, he, he announced his, uh, he began his questioning, I can tell him that we will uh, continue to uh, look at ways in which we can toughen up those provisions and to come down hard on those who irresponsibly allow uh, dangerous and extremist content uh, to permeate the internet. But, Mr Speaker, uh, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm delighted that uh, he's taking this, this new uh, tough line, and I very much hope uh, that, he can, that he will get uh, the rest of his party in the lobbies with us to join him. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I did start in a collegiate spirit, and I'll continue in a collegiate spirit, because I listened hard to what was being said on the opposite benches on Monday about the concerns about this issue. Um, uh, and we do need uh, to recognise the measures in the Bill, but we do need tough and effective sanctions, and that means criminal sanctions. And that does matter, Mr Speaker. It, it, it is frankly beyond belief that, as the Mirror reported yesterday, 40 hours of hateful content from Anjum Chowdhury could be easily accessed online. The Prime Minister and the Government could stop this by making it clear that directors of companies are criminally liable for failing to tackle this type of material on their sites. We don't need to delay, so in the collaborative spirit we saw in this House on Monday, will the Prime Minister commit to taking this away, looking at it again, and working with all of us to strengthen his proposed legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I, I, I've already said that we're willing to uh, look at anything to strengthen the legislation. I've said that we're willing to uh, bring it forward, uh, and we will bring it forward to second reading before Christmas. And yes, of course, Mr. Speaker, uh, we will have criminal sanctions uh, with tough sentences uh, for those who are responsible for allowing this foul content to, to permeate the internet, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but what we hope for also is that no matter how tough the proposals we produce, that the, honor, that the opposition uh, will support it. Yeah. 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 
Mr Speaker, we're making progress. We've got the second reading committed to before Christmas. That is a good thing. And I think the Prime Minister is now committed to criminal sanctions. At the moment, they're a fallback position um, at the discretion of the Minister. Um, they should be, in my view, on the face of the bill as the automatic default for the failure to act. Now, if we're making progress on that, then we're beginning to address some of the issues that were uh, identified across the House on Monday. Can I turn to the... Um, report the Commission for Countering Extremism, which was set up in the wake of the horrific Manchester bombings. Eight months ago, that Commission made recommendations to plug gaps in existing legislation and strategy, gaps that extremists have been able to exploit and are continuing to exploit. Yet Sir Mark Rowley, formerly head of our counter-terrorism policing, who led on those recommendations, said just this week I've had no feedback from the Home Office on their plans in relation to our report on the absence of a coherent legal framework to tackle hateful extremism. Given the seriousness of the matter and the clear need for action, why has the government not responded to this important work? And will the Prime Minister now commit to act swiftly on the Commission's recommendations? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government, to my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, works with all parties to tackle violent extremism, and the UK has one of the strongest uh, counter-terrorism and counter-extremism uh, systems in the world, as a consequence of which we have foiled 31 terrorist plots uh, since 2017. And I pay tribute to the work of, of Sir Mark Rowley, with whom I worked extremely closely while I was in London, and, uh, and all those who are involved in foiling those terrorist plots. And I can uh, tell you, Mr Speaker, that they will receive the complete support of this House and, uh, and, and, and of this, uh, this Government, uh, nor will we allow them to be released, or those who are convicted, to be released early from prison, Mr Speaker, because that was one of the most important things this Government passed and which that party opposed. Keir Starmer. Really? After the week we've just had, I, 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 re I, I really don't want to descend to that kind of knockabout. Mr Speaker, e either, we take this, either we take this seriously, and I'm taking my lead from those on the opposite benches on Monday and what they were saying about the need to tackle this, either we take it seriously and go forward together, or we do a disservice to those that we pay tributes to. There are clearly, prob there are clearly problems with the government's counter-extremism strategy. Internet users are increasingly likely to come across extremist content online. The government's own independent reviewer has said that there is no evidence that the government's key de-radicalisation programme is effective. That's the government's independent reviewer saying that. And we've seen a spate of lone attack killings with the perpetrator invariably radicalised online. We all want to stop this across this House, but at the moment things are getting worse, not better. So what urgent plans does the Prime Minister have to fix these glaring problems? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, well Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in favour of uh, collegiate and cooperative uh, approach, and, 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 and then, uh, in, in which case, I think it would be a fine thing if the uh, opposition would withdraw their opposition to uh, our measures to stop the early release of, of serious extremist and violent offenders. That's all, that's all I'm trying to say. In a, in a, in a, in a collegiate approach, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that is what the people of this country uh, would wish to see. Uh, but we will continue to do everything that we can uh, to strengthen our counter-terrorism oper operation and to support all those uh, who are involved in keeping us safe. And, uh, obviously, it is too early to draw any particular conclusions from the appalling killing of our, of our colleague, uh, but we will draw all relevant conclusions from that investigation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. The inescapable desire of this House on Monday to finally clamp down on the extremism, the hate and the abuse that festers online is incredibly welcome. Yeah. But closing down anonymous accounts would not have prevented the murder of Joe Cox, nor of PC Keith Palmer, and although we don't know the full circumstances surrounding his death, nor would it have saved Sir David. If we're to get serious about stopping violent attacks, we need to stop online spaces being safe spaces for terrorists. We need to ensure that unaccountable, arrogant social media companies take responsibility for their platforms. We need to end the delays, get on with the legislation and clean out the cesspit once and for all. 
Mr Speaker, I've prosecuted terrorists and I've prosecuted extremists. I've worked with Sir Mark and others. Dozens of Labour MPs have worked hard on tackling social media companies on these issues. I started collegiately and I'll continue collegiately. We know what it takes. We can help. So will the Prime Minister now capture the spirit that we've seen this week and agree to work with us on a cross-party basis so that we can tackle violent extremism and its enablers together? Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to join the uh, right honourable gentleman in uh, committing to tackle, tackling online harms uh, together, to tackling violent extremism together, and that, that is what uh, the government is doing. And that's why we brought forward the online harms bill. Uh, that's why we're investing uh, record sums in tackling counter-terrorism. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, I, I must say that what I think the whole country and the whole House would certainly want to see, in addition, in addition, if I can say this to the, to the right honourable gentleman in a, in, a, in a collegiate spirit, in addition is a commitment uh, by the Labour Party in future to support measures and not to allow the early release of those terrorists and those who are convicted of those offences from prison. And I, if, if, if you could hear that from the Labour Party, I think it would be a fine thing. Crispin Blunt. Um, Mr Speaker, knowing my right honourable friend's commitment to UK bioscience, and his understanding of the exciting potential for improving mental health treatments for conditions such as depression, trauma and addiction, will he cut through the current barriers to research into psilocybin and similar compounds so the British public receive and British science research and British pharmaceutical companies enable the potential treatments into these most debilitating conditions to be delivered at the earliest possible opportunity? Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend I know who has a very active interest in this, in this area. What I can say to him is that we will consider the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs uh, recent advice on, on reducing barriers to research uh, with uh, controlled drugs such as the one he uh, describes, and we'll be getting back to him as soon as possible. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I join with the Leader of the Opposition in sending condolences to the family of Ernie Ross? <clears throat> Mr Speaker, in 11 short days, world leaders will gather in Glasgow for COP26. This is our best chance, and very likely our last chance, to confront the climate emergency faced by our planet. That is why it was such a devastating blow that on the eve of COP26, this UK government rejected the Scottish Clusters bid to gain track one status for carbon capture storage. Today's Press and Journal have said there is no valid reason and no acceptable excuse for this decision and have called for a U-turn on this colossal mistake immediately. We know this decision wasn't made on technical or logical grounds. This devastating decision was purely political. Scotland's North East was promised this investment in 2014. It is a promise that has been broken time and time again. So, Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister finally live up to those promises, or are they simply not worth the Tory election leaflets that they are written on? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we remain absolutely committed to uh, helping uh, industrial clusters to decarbonise across uh, the whole of the country, and of course, including Scotland. And uh, I, I know that the, the I know that there was disappointment about the Acorn uh, bid in in Aberdeen, and that's why it has been selected as a reserve cluster, Mr. Speaker. But there could be no more vivid testimony to this government's commitment uh, to Scotland, uh, or, or indeed to fighting climate change, that the whole world is about to come uh, to Scotland, uh, Mr. Speaker, to look at what Scotland is doing to help tackle climate change. And I congratulate the people of Scotland on their efforts. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, people across Scotland are looking for answers today, and they're getting none. Yeah. All they see is yet another Tory broken promise. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. bad enough that this UK government is holding back Captain Carter in Scotland. But across the board, they are proving an active barrier to renewable energy opportunities. Yeah. Tidal stream energy has the potential to generate 20% of UK generation capacity, exactly the same Prime Minister as nuclear. Yeah. All this industry needs is a ring fence budget yeah. of £71 million, oh. a drop in the ocean, 
compared to the £23 billion pounds that this government is throwing at the nuclear plant yeah, in yeah, Hickney. Yeah. But the UK government are failing to give this support, threatening shovel-ready projects like Magen in the north of Scotland. Yeah. So at the very least today, Prime Minister, stand up and guarantee a ring-fenced budget for tidal stream energy and save this renewable industry from being lost overseas. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, actually, I, you know, I, I congratulate uh, the right honourable gentleman on raising uh, tidal energy. He's absolutely right. I've seen the, the, the amazing uh, projects that are, that are underway, and we're certainly we're, we're looking at, uh, at finance. We're putting huge sums, I think the House uh, will acknowledge, into clean, green energy generation. And he's far too gloomy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, about the prospects of, of Acorn in, uh, in, in Aberdeen. I think he needs to be a seeds with an unaccustomed spirit uh, of optimism. Uh, because, because actually, uh, the, Acorn, the, Acorn, the Acorn project still has strong potential, and that's why it's been selected as a reserve cluster. And he should keep hope alive, Mr. Speaker, rather than uh, spreading gloom in the way that he does. The back door. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman and the new quiet man of British politics. Long may it continue. <laughs> Two week the, weekend before, the weekend before last, I went to sea with the Brixham trawlers, and Brixham Fish Market is now turning over £1.4 million a week. They're looking forward to their share of the levelling up fund, but they're also looking forward to the previously announced £100 million fisheries and seafood scheme. When will we be seeing that Pillar 2 and 3 launch, and will the Prime Minister reaffirm his commitment to our coastal communities and our fishing sector? I thank my honourable friend for what he's doing for, the, uh, for, for fishing and, for, and for, for the coastal communities, and for Brixham in particular. I understand the fish market in uh, Brixham was outstandingly successful. Uh, the other day, and what we're going to do is make sure that we continue to support uh, fishing and the seafood business across the, the country. And uh, the scheme has approved funding in Brixham, in Salcombe, and in Dartmouth, uh, Mr. Speaker. And a further £100 million is being made available uh, through the UK Seafood Fund to support our fisheries. Liz Savile Roberts. If COP26 is to be successful, People must be at the heart of our net zero emission. For too long, the UK economy has left too many people behind, with wealth and investment hoarded in the southeast of England. Devolving powers over the Crown Estate would bring half a billion pounds worth of offshore wind and tidal stream potential under Welsh control. Assets, of course, currently controlled by Westminster. Scotland, meanwhile, already has these powers. Will he support my bill to devolve the management of the Crown Estate to Wales? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, as, as she already knows, the Crown Estate works closely with the Welsh Government and with natural resources in Wales. And I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell her that uh, my view is that the Crown Estate in Wales, uh, the devolution of the Crown Estate in Wales would fragment the market, uh, complicate uh, existing processes and make it more difficult uh, for Wales as well as the, the whole of the UK uh, to move forward to, to net zero. Brendan Clarksmith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Delivering new homes is key to levelling up, uh, as is putting that power in the hands of local people and making sure we build the right number in the right places. But my constituents, especially in Thievesdale and Audsall, are concerned about over-intensive developments in our local plan. Will the Prime Minister confirm that the minimum housing requirement for Bassett Law is 4,896 ah. and not the 10,000 as claimed by the Labour on Council? Ah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm not surprised to say that my honourable friend is completely right. And, uh, he, and this government is, uh, is determined to give the people of this country the, the homes that they need. We're building record numbers of homes, but we owe it uh, to, uh, to our, our kinder, gentler politics, Mr Speaker, to, uh, to be accurate about what is going on in our constituencies. And this government does not set local housing uh, targets. And I understand that the draft Bassett Law local plan is subject uh, to consultation. I would encourage him and his constituents to make their views known. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, tomorrow at 2.50pm, my constituency will fall silent as we mark exactly 50 years since Scotland's largest peacetime explosion ripped through Clarkston Toll in East Renfrewshire. 
Ten shops were demolished by the ignition of gas which had escaped from a fractured gas main beneath the shops. A passing bus was caught up in the blast. 22 people died, mostly women, and over 100 were injured. Tomorrow, 50 years on, the community and families will come together for a memorial service. So will the Prime Minister join me in acknowledging the terrible losses that many families locally suffered <coughs> and the continuing sorrow in the community and in reflecting that the victims of the Clarkston disaster must never be forgotten. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Lady for, for raising this uh, anniversary and uh, she is right to commemorate the victims of the Clarkson disaster and uh, I, our thoughts and our condolences continue to be with uh, the families of those who, who lost, uh, lost loved ones and of course we must do everything in our power to make sure that no such uh, tragedy is repeated. Robinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The failings of Greater Manchester Police, which have led to it being placed in special measures, are well documented, including the failure to record 80,000 crimes in a single year, and those included domestic violence and sexual offences. But it's particularly important that the force addresses what, the recent, what a recent Manchester Evening News investigation called its culture of denial and secrecy. After the horrific murder of Sarah Everard, it's crucial that we tackle the cover-up culture. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, therefore, join me in calling for Greater Manchester Police to urgently review its internal culture? And also, will he consider reforming the law on whistleblowing so people in Greater Manchester Police and other organisations can speak up against wrongdoing in confidence? Yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah, yes, Mr Speaker, it's vital that people should uh, have the confidence to speak up against wrongdoing wherever they find it, particularly, of, of course, in the, in the police. I, I do believe that the people of uh, Greater Manchester deserve better. I, I, I support and agree with what uh, my honourable friend says. I would just say one thing, Mr Speaker. It, it is the responsibility of the Mayor of Greater Manchester uh, to ensure that the, uh, that the police force acts, uh, not a, a point that I hope will be taken up on the benches opposite, uh, to ensure that the, the police force acts swiftly and decisively to address the failures that his constituents are currently finding. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to join colleagues in paying tribute to the Honourable Member for South and on Sea. He was a good friend and an esteemed parliamentarian. I also wish to pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Old Baxley and Sidco. He served this House and country absolutely and will be missed by members across the House. Mr. Speaker, heating bills, food shops and fuel costs are all rising at a staggering speed. This winter, millions of families on universal credit will be forced to choose between eating or heating. Given the crisis in living costs we are now facing, will the Prime Minister reconsider his scrapping of the universal credit uplift and reinstate the £20 a week lifeline he has just taken away? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, what we're doing is ensuring that uh, we keep costs of heating down with the the, the price cap. We put the we put the uh, we put we've increased the winter uh, the, the warm heat the warm homes allowance uh, by 150 thousand 150 pounds for 780 thousand uh, homes, and we've just given local councils another half billion uh, to help uh, poorer families uh, over uh, over the winter. But the most important thing that's happening, Mr. Speaker, in this country is that wages are going up. And uh, there, is a, there is a huge jobs boom now in this country, thanks to the policies that this government has pursued. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure my right honourable friend would agree with me that homeless people should be assisted and not arrested. The review of the repeal of the Vagrancy Act 1824 has now been concluded. Does my right honourable friend agree with me, therefore, that it is now time that the amendments yes. to the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, which are being considered in the other place, should be adopted so that we can consign the Vagrancy Act yes. to the history books forever, but give the police the powers they need to combat trespass, aggressive begging and other antisocial behaviour. Yes. 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 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, my, my honourable friend is a passionate campaigner on this issue, and he, 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 he's done a lot of, uh, of good things in this area. No one should be criminalised simply for having nowhere to live, and I think the time has come to reconsider the Vagrancy Act, Mr. Speaker, but also to redouble our efforts uh, to fight homelessness, as I think we've done successfully over the pandemic, but must continue to do. Lynn Fletcher. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. University Hospitals, Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust, has dealt with more than 600 attacks on staff during the pandemic. To deter further attacks, staff in the hospital's A&E department are now wearing body cameras. It simply isn't right that doctors and nurses should have to go to such lengths just to feel safe at work. Will the Prime Minister join me in condemning those abhorrent attacks and say what immediate steps he will take to better protect our NHS heroes as they go about their work treating patients and saving lives? Yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I join the Honourable Lady Opposite uh, absolutely in condemning attacks on, uh, on all public uh, servants, and particularly on NHS staff who are, who are trying to, to save people and, 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 and help people in, in their lives. And uh, what, we are, what we are doing, what we have already done, is to toughen the sentences uh, for those who assault or, for, or, who, or who harass public servants. We now come to Charlize Barlow, final question. Given the recent tragic circumstances, there has inevitably been a focus on the security of members and their staff. Mr Speaker, one aspect that is often overlooked is the fact that it is our staff who are on the front line in receiving the abusive emails and correspondence, and they take the hostile phone calls. They are private citizens, simply trying to earn a living to put food on the table and pay for their rent or their mortgage. Yet they are caught up in this vicious cycle of venom and abuse that is directed towards us. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, take this opportunity to acknowledge the fantastic work that our staff do and give them the credit that they so rightly deserve? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, my right honourable friend spoke there for the entire House of Commons, because uh, we all know that uh, it is our staff, our, our caseworkers, our office managers uh, who are so often uh, in the front line, who have to deal uh, with anger, uh, with intemperate uh, behaviour uh, and with abuse, and they cope with it uh, magnificently. We all know that the, risks, the risks that they run in their daily lives, and indeed, Mr Speaker, we have seen how some House of Commons staff have paid uh, for, that, for, that, for their sacrifice, in, even with their lives. And, Mr Speaker, I thoroughly echo and support and concur with what uh, my honourable friend has said. Order.